Amen. Friends, I invite you to remain standing as the Word of God is brought to the middle of our congregation, reminding us that this is the Word of God for us, the people of God. We're starting a new sermon series today, A Heart Strangely Warmed, looking some of, at some of the ways that make, or some of the things about us that make us United Methodists. Our scripture lesson today comes from, John, from 1 John chapter 4, beginning with the seventh verse. Beloved, let us love one another because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this, in, in this love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the father has sent his son as the savior of the world. God abides in those who confess that Jesus is the son of God and they abide in God. So we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love and those who abide in love abide in God and God abides in them. Love has been perfected among us in this that we may have boldness on the day of judgment because as he is, so are we in the world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear for fear has to do with punishment and whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. We love because he first loved us. Friends, this is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. <coughs> Friends, let us go to God in an attitude of prayer. Gracious and loving God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing unto you. For you, O oh God, are this community's rock and redeemer. Amen. When I was a little child, I would go to worship, I would go to church a lot with my granny to Watson United Methodist Church in Watson, Arkansas. And Watson United Methodist Church had this really quaint tradition of, they had a small little bank that it was in the shape of a church that sat on the, the altar rail at the front of the sanctuary. And every week, the pastor would ask if it was anybody's birthday in the coming week. And if someone raised their hand or if multiple people raised their hands, the choir or the congregation would then start singing the happy birthday song. And the birthday boy and girl or boy or girl would come make their way down the aisle as the song was sung. And they would put a special offering into the church bank that was there at the kneeling rail. Now, as a kid... I loved watching this at my granny's church. And every week that it was someone else's birthday, I, find my, I found myself stumbling just a little bit with my own jealousy that I wanted to be able to walk down while everybody sang to me. And I didn't quite understand what was happening because I didn't really know why they were putting money in the church bank. And I realized I had forgotten about this tradition until a few years ago when Nathan was serving at Bologna United Methodist Church and they still had the tradition of singing happy birthday every week and the birthday boy or girl making a, a, placing a special gift into the church bank. So I looked into this. I hadn't seen it in years. And as it turns out, there are lots of churches that still have the church bank and United Methodist churches and other denominations alike. And I found out that this, the offering that the birthday person gives, it doesn't just go into the norm, the regular offering plate or the church's general budget. It usually goes to support some special mission or ministry of the church, like food pantries or emergency relief funds. The practice is not just to recognize the birthday boy or girl like I had once thought, but rather it was a way for the birthday boy or girl to have an act of thanksgiving as a part of their birthday celebration. For in bringing that offering forward, they were, they were recognizing first that age old truth that it's better to give than to receive. 
but also that practice of thanksgiving and flipping around what we normally expect on birthdays of giving a gift instead of receiving one, the birthday person recognizes in that act of thanksgiving that they've already received the best gift. They're recognizing that in church, in worship. They're recognizing the best gift they could ever receive, they've already received, and that is the love of God in Jesus Christ. We, re, we heard in 1 John that the love of God in Jesus Christ, this best gift that we can receive, the love of God is revealed fully to us in Jesus Christ. That God sent Christ into the world to reveal the fullness of God's love to all the world. And so we celebrate and worship each week that God is made known to us in Jesus Christ, that God is revealed to us in Jesus Christ. But also when we come to worship, we profess not just to be a church or any old gathering of people, but rather we are the body of Christ. And so we recognize that as God is revealed in Jesus Christ, we as the body of Christ on earth today, we have a part in that of revealing God to the world. We've received the greatest gift, and our call is to reveal this gift, the gift of God's love, with all the world. As United Methodist, we have been always been rooted in this understanding of God's love. We as a church, we as a denomination, are rooted in the invitational love of God. That as God's love has been shared with us, we are called to reveal it and to share it with others. You could say that it's just who we are. We've been loved, so we love. You could say it's who we are, but you could also say it's, it's who we've always been. I have this practice, and it's part curiosity and part anticipation. I will study Eleanor, my daughter's, I will study her facial expressions and her habits. And I do this because since the time she was a baby, I would always have people tell me about their children and how, oh, my daughter, ever since she was a baby, she would sleep on her left side. And she always sleeps in her left side. Or my son, he would always stick his right foot out of the blanket. And to this day, he kicks his right foot out of the blanket whenever he sleeps. So I've, I've studied Eleanor since she was a baby and a toddler wondering when you when she questions me and she makes that face raising her her right upper lip just so much I've always wondered are you always gonna do that Eleanor <laughs> I've always wondered since she was an infant she's made that scrunchy nose face and I've wondered are you always gonna do that you sleep on your left side a lot are you always going to do that? If we take that, that idea and look at the United Methodist Church as in its infancy or in its toddlerhood, are you always going to do that? We look back to who we were and we were a, a people who were rooted in the love of God that it needs to be shared. John Wesley the founder of the Methodist movement, he talked about the marks of a Methodist. So very early on, what were those distinguishing marks? What were the, 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 the so-called, or follow me if you will, the facial expressions or the quirks or the habits? What were the, the defining marks of a Methodist? And he said that the marks of the Methodist are not our opinions. The marks of a Methodist are not our opinions, but rather a Methodist is one who has the love of God shed abroad in their heart. Friends, this is who we are and who we have always been, the people who have the love of God shed abroad in our hearts. Wesley, as he started this movement, he rooted us in the love of God in some very powerful ways. As he started his ministry in the 18th century, the world was changing as the Industrial Revolution was emerging. His, his own community was transitioning from a rural community to an urban one. 
And with all of these transitions, the city's population was growing at such a rate that the infrastructure couldn't keep up. And so every day he saw head, all the horrible headlines of what the, the consequences that this was playing. He read the, the awful headlines about terrible working conditions, unsafe working conditions, horrible living conditions, drug and alcohol problems, rises in crime, lack of education, and lack of health care. And as he saw all of these headlines and this story that was emerging from his community, he wondered, where's the church in all of this? How is God's love being revealed in the midst of all of this? And he realized that for the most part, you know, good middle and upper class church people were content to attend Bible studies and worship services and teas at the church. They were content to receive and experience the love of God within the comfort of the four walls of the church, closing the doors, closing their doors to the tragedies and the traumas, the riffraff, and the danger that lurked right outside of their doors. And so as, as Wesley took serious this call to receive God's love and to share it, the gospel was pushing him to fling wide open the doors of the church. And so he started to have this saying that the world is my parish, he would say. The world is my parish. Now, don't mis let's not misunderstand. It's not that Wesley thought he was going to single-handedly go out there and change the world, but rather he was acknowledging that the world started one foot outside of the church doors, one foot outside of his own home. The world, the, the community to which he's called started even outside of his own church. And so he gathered a group and he began to be in ministry with those right outside of his own doors. So he gathered a group who would go and share the love of God with others just as they had received it. At first they shared it in very tangible ways. They started the first form of public schools offering education for the community so that no longer would only the community's wealthy and elite be able to educate their young people. They started health clinics, which then became, the, became what we know as mo our modern day hospital systems. If you think about how this, this legacy continues today, how many times have you traveled and noticed a United Methodist college or university or a Methodist healthcare system. We have two United Methodist colleges in Arkansas, Philander Smith College and Hendricks College. And then if you travel to Memphis, you'll see the, the Methodist Le Bonheur healthcare system. All of this because of the roots that we have in offering God's love in tangible ways. Not only did the early Methodists offer God's love in tangible ways, meeting people where they are and meeting the needs that they had, they also offered the transformational love of God as they didn't just reach out in service, they also reached out and loved and formed communities of faith so that people could gather together and nurture this love that was in their hearts and deepen their own faith based upon this love. And so this Methodist movement, it took off like wildfire. I think it took off for a couple of reasons. One, it was so needed in the midst of the pain and brokenness of the world. But two, it took off because people were, the love of God was shed abroad in their hearts. They were so full of the love of God that all they could do was find ways to share it and to make God's love visible and known in the world. So it's always been a part of who we are as United Methodists, back to that little church bank, to proclaim that it's better to give than to receive, that God's love is meant to be shared because it's not just about filling our own cups. 
It's not just about enriching our own lives or saving our own souls. While all of that is important, it doesn't stop with us. God's love starts here, but it's just the starting place. The love of God, it, it awakens in us this desire to share God's love out in the world. Eleanor also had, she has a little sign in her room that someone cross-stitched. And I realized this week in preparing for this sermon, we've always hung that in her room because it was a gift at a baby shower for her. But I think this wall hanging may need to hang in our bedroom. Because this wall hanging says there are two special gifts we should give our children. The first is roots. And the second is wings. I think Nathan and I need to hang this in our room so that we remember this as we are raising Eleanor. But I also think that this same little, this little wall hanging could be hung in our church. It could be hung in our denomination. That there are two special gifts that God gives us. Roots and wings we've received the greatest gift God's love and this love has has rooted us as it has bound us to God and bound us to one another but this love has also given us wings because as we receive this love we are then sent out into the world to the world which is our parish to share this love with others John Wesley is the founder of our the Methodist movement he revealed to us these roots and these wings. And this history and these gifts, they continue today in our church, of our, of, at North Little Rock First United Methodist Church. Our church is bound to God and we're bound to one another, but we've also bound ourselves to our community. We've bound ourselves to our neighbors at Indian Hills Elementary School so that when we learned that there were children who go home and experience food insecurity, we started a backpack feeding ministry. And when we learned that that number grew, instead of saying, well, that's too much for us, we stepped up the gifts that we give so that we could feed more young people right outside of our own door. And when we learned that there was a, a ministry that was providing a meal to the homeless and hungry in Little Rock, we said we want to be a part of that. So we joined the Broadway Bridge Feeding Ministry. And we learned that there were other days that needed to be picked up. We added another day to our rotation. All because we saw the physical needs, knowing that God's love was sending us out to address those physical needs. We also have bound ourselves to one another in our community as we've made it a commitment to invest in the lives of children and young people so that children will learn very early on about God's great love for them. And we continue to share that good news for our youth so that they will always know that the church is a place for them and is a place where they can experience the love of God and find people who care about them and will help to nurture them as they're figuring out their faith on their own. But we also recognized that we were, as we were bound to one another, we were bound to care for one another's souls. So we increased our commitment to adult discipleship. All of this happening at the same time, knowing that as we nurture the love of God in us, that love also sends us out into the world. It's all because it's, it's who we are. And it's who we've always been as United Methodists that we are rooted in God's love. And we love not because we're great people, not because we are so humble or so generous. We love simply because God loves us. We love others because God first loved us. So think of it like this, God's love, we, we love all because God has loved us. If you think about that motion, the motion that it makes, that God's love, we love because God loves us. You can also say that God's love is, is always on its way to somebody else. God's love is always on its way to somebody else. 
So friends, may we, may we find our roots in God's love and may this love give us the wings that we are called to have out into the world. May God's love grow here. May God's love be experienced here in all of us. May God's love be experienced in this place. But may we not be content and satisfied with that. May God's love carry us out all of our doors to the places that are hungry and thirsty for God's love. Amen.